This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique <laughs> way. This is a show about science. Oh. oh my God. By scientists. Tonight, Techno's journey to the Arctic. 13 days, sub-freezing temperatures, endless sun. It is past midnight right now, and the sun just is not gonna set. Climb on board the US Coast Guard icebreaker, Healy. So what would happen to the average ship if they tried anything like this? Well, you've heard of the Titanic, right? But Arctic ice is melting, and oil drilling is starting up. How do oil spills and sea ice mix? If it does happen, it's going to be a mess. What would happen if disaster struck this frozen paradise? You're looking for that needle in a haystack. A mission that could mean life. If you can picture looking down at a bowl of water through a straw. Or death. So how'd it go? I'm Phil Torres. Now, Techno's journey to the Arctic. It's summer high up in the Arctic Circle, and this is what you expect to see. Ice as far as the horizon. The only way through it is on this ship, the Coast Guard Cutter Healy. It's one of only two icebreakers in the United States built to handle polar ice. The ride can get a little rough. That noise there, that's the sound of being in the bow of an icebreaker. But there is trouble in this frozen paradise. Now images like this are becoming more common in the summer months. We even caught a polar bear. Look, look on the camera screen, he's dead center. I see him moving. Like many species, forced to search further for ice and food as sea ice retreats in this part of the world. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the globe, and that's causing a sea change in this frontier. Summer sea ice has receded close to 25% since 1979. On land, we saw it. Birch trees are sprouting on the tundra, and melting permafrost is causing land and structures to sink. Captain Jason Hamilton is the Healy's commanding officer. He's also a veteran of both poles. 10 years ago, uh, when I uh, first was operating, this was complete ice, whereas now we have some open water. How does that affect your operations? There are more people operating up here. More tourists, more ships, and no more illustration of change than this. During the summer of 2015, offshore oil exploration, as Shell begins drilling in the Chukchi Sea. What are the unique challenges to responding to a disaster in the Arctic? Well, the unique challenges are uh, the distance, uh, we have from uh, any one port, a lack of resources and infrastructure aside from ourselves that would make it challenging. But the Healy is designed to do more than respond in tough circumstances. It's also a floating science lab. Here, scientists work side by side with the Coast Guard to study the changing Arctic and develop technology that will function in one of the world's harshest environments. This summer, Techno is invited aboard for the mission. Along with several scientists, our instructions are to meet up with the ship outside of the port of Nome, Alaska. We are issued these orange suits, called Mustangs. Protection in case someone goes overboard. A fall into frigid waters could mean death within minutes. Ahead, our home for the next two weeks, the Healy. Once all the scientists and I are aboard, the ship gets underway. Our journey will take us from Nome to about a thousand miles from the North Pole, a region remote, pristine, and once all but impassable, except for a polar icebreaker like the Healy. But scientists say summers here could soon 
be ice free. We are now passing through the narrowest part of the Bering Strait, where we've got United States to my left, and to my right, just 50 miles away, is Russia. Now, during these warmer months, hundreds of ships are passing through here, and that number is expected to rise as the levels of sea ice recede. And the Bering Strait is important to more than just ships. It is also a major migration way for hundreds of thousands of marine mammals every year. The plan is to uh, finish the brief here and then go into the launch and recovery of the Puma unmanned aircraft. It's just before 8 a.m. July 9th. Time to find out what this mission is all about. Healy's first test of the day, an automatic capture system for remote-controlled aircraft. How confident are we in the machinery we're using? How reliable is it? Before every operation, a briefing is held to determine risk. Everyone involved gets to weigh in. Three, four. The higher the number, the higher the risk. So, Captain, uh, guard score 23 in the green, sir. I recommend you proceed, sir. There'll be a lot of traffic coming through here. And with increased usage, there's a higher potential for an incident to occur. Scott Tripp is the chief science officer for this mission. It's his job to oversee research operations aboard the Healy. So we want to increase our capability up here. We want to keep it safe for everybody. When it comes to safety during operations like this, orange is definitely the new black. Time for me to suit up. Today's test flights will be the first of many. Drones are a big part of this mission, in the air, on the water, even under the ice. What's special about unmanned vehicles? Why are you looking at them? Well, two things. Uh, an unmanned vehicle is a nice extension of an uh, asset, and you can look beyond the horizon and extend your reach, which is really good. Also, because of the harsh environment up here, there's times when, when it's really dangerous to be out there with a manned asset, and we can sacrifice a drone. All right, so what is this thing? So this is called a wave glider. It's basically a very small autonomous surface vessel. It looks like a fancy paddle board. Yes, it does, and that's kind of what it is. This glider will collect data on the ocean for NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. The motion of the waves will propel it, while solar panels power its sensors and communications. So with this thing, what are you guys measuring? So this particular one is measuring carbon, both in the atmosphere, kind of right in here, it sucks air in here, and also how much carbon dioxide is dissolved in the water. We're pumping a lot of carbon dioxide into the air, so it's going somewhere, and all about 30% of it is ending up in the ocean. It is now July 10th, just past 11 a.m. Go time for the NOAA team's wave glider. A Coast Guard crew hooks the glider to the ship's crane and maneuvers it out over the water before release. As soon as it's in the water, the science begins. Um, as long as nothing wears out, it can kind of stay out there forever. This wave glider is just one of many research devices NOAA is using to study a 20-mile area of the Chukchi Sea. They'll measure everything from temperature, salinity, and oxygen to chlorophyll blooms. Why did you guys choose here? So this is a site that we've been here for a long time. We, this is a um, concentrated area where we have a long time series of measurements. I understand, incidentally, this is near where Shell will be. Yes, that just trail. happens to be a uh, coincidence, actually. Yes, we're, we're probably going to be within about 10 miles of where they're going to be is that drilling. Of interest? Um, we will see. I mean, the primary purpose of this project is to look at the physical and um, chemical kind of ocean properties as the ice melts and retreats. Getting this big chem lab on a buoy into the water is a delicate operation. This smaller buoy is much simpler to lower over the side. It's designed to track movement of water below the surface. As we head north, these buoys will continue gathering data on Arctic water and ice, data that will help illuminate the impact of global warming and the changes we're already witnessing here. I sometimes feel like I have a front row seat to some very dramatic changes. Andy Mahoney is a geophysicist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. 
He's been studying polar sea ice for 15 years. Regardless of whether those changes are positive or negative for some people, rapid change is always an alarming thing to see. There's much more science to be done. Luckily here, the days are really long. The sun just is not gonna set. We're that far north up here in the Arctic. July 10th, we've been in the Arctic for two days and still no sign of ice. Meanwhile, I'm learning my way around the Coast Guard cutter Healy, sort of. Of course, the crew make getting around even the tightest spaces look easy. But on the third morning, this happened. Last night when I went to bed, it was open oceans. This morning when I woke up, it looks like this. We're in the Chukchi Sea, north of the 71st parallel, and the Healy is breaking ice. How does that actually work? Well, we're 16,000 tons, and we can get up to 30,000 horsepower. You get a bunch of power headed in a particular direction and a lot of weight coming down on the ice, and we break it. So what would happen to the average ship if they tried anything like this? Well, you've heard of the Titanic, right? I've heard of this. Ice flows can be hard on technology, too like drones. That's one of the reasons NOAA and the Coast Guard are working with this unmanned aircraft, called a Puma. It can take this kind of beating yeah. and keep on flying. It's designed for the wings to come off on impact, and that's one of the ways it dissipates energy. But uh, it, it is amazing how hard a hit it can take and just be put back together and fly it again. So this here is your Puma. What can you tell me about it? So this vehicle, it's hand-launched, and it can be recovered after deep stall landing in the water, on the ice, and the road, and the grass. So it can really be used in, in all environments. Inside, it carries a camera that shoots video and infrared. We think will be relevant in the Arctic for dealing with oil spills, search and rescue, and science missions, including counting of wildlife. But launching a small boat in icy water to pick up the puma can also be risky. NOAA is testing a GPS-guided system to land it automatically into this net on the side of the ship. But the puma doesn't always make it to the net. How has that net recovery gone for you? We've had mixed results, and this is my third year working in the Arctic with the puma system. And I will say this is a tremendously challenging environment. We've seen GPS having a hard time to get a lock because the satellites are so low on the horizon. This is what innovation looks like. It has its successes, it has its failures, and in this case, they're literally picking up the pieces, putting it back together, gonna launch again. There's a lot of projects going on right now on the Healy. What do you think is the most exciting one? The isotope sniffer has a lot of potential to do some pretty interesting things. And this could be a sentinel with an alert that replaces manned assets having to do patrols. This is the intake that we have for our continuous atmospheric sampling. This tube on Healy's bow is the nose of the isotope sniffer. Every second, it sends air samples down to two isotope analyzers in a makeshift lab below. And if you're wondering why they're strapped down... We're up at the front of the ship, so yeah. uh, it's making some noise, hitting yeah. some ice. That's crashing through ice, which is why we have all this strapped down. The isotope sniffer is being tested by Jeff Welker and Eric Klein, both scientists for the Arctic Domain Awareness Center at the University of Alaska, Anchorage. So when we're out here and we're getting this air in, to us it's just kind of misty Arctic air. But what you don't see are all the different isotopic compositions that will change depending on how much sea ice is there, the humidity, the temperature. Contamination will also change the isotopic composition of the air, like oil. Like shell in the Arctic here, we want to make sure that we're well aware of any mishaps that might occur very early. Well, our vision is to take this device, put it inside a NOAA 
buoy and then circle those buoys around an oil platform so that then we have uh, guardians of this habitat. Those buoys surrounding the platform could give us an immediate warning that something has happened, we need to do something now. It may be two years before this technology is ready to be deployed, but there's one big reason for it. The drilling shell will start here is on everyone's mind. How do oil spills and sea ice mix? What happens when the two are involved? Fortunately, nobody really knows because it hasn't happened yet. If it does happen, it's going to be a mess. So it's going to be extremely challenging to separate the oil from that ice. Ice will be somewhat like a sponge, and so you'll have a mix of oil-covered ocean, oil-covered ice, and oil-impregnated ice to deal with. And if it gets in the ice, it could also move as well. That's right, and that's why it's important to understand ice motion. Dr. Mahoney is working on enhancing ice radar so it can track ice movement as well as ice presence. So we're looking here at a screenshot from a radar that's mounted up in the bridge of the Healy. This is a time lapse of images from that radar as the Healy navigates through ice. The ship is in the middle. The white, brighter areas show us where the ice is and the dark areas indicate where there's likely open water. We use an image processing technique called optical flow that allows us to work out how fast different bits of the image are moving at the same time. Here's the same time lapse process to show the ice movement as well as the ships. We can calculate how fast the ice is moving over the ground, calculate the true motion of the ice. So from the ship's perspective, we're moving past the ice, but from the ice's perspective, it's moving a little bit too. Exactly, the ice is almost constantly in drift in the Arctic Ocean, sometimes reaching speeds of, of two to three knots. How does this fit into your ice research? It's important to understand how the ice is moving dynamically over the ocean. That ties into how the ice is gonna to respond to all kinds of changes that may be uh, predicted in the future. But the future is now, and that concerns scientists who study this delicate balance of water and ice. In this part of the Arctic, the, the Alaska Arctic, if you like, has seen some of the fastest and most extensive retreats of sea ice uh, anywhere in, in the Arctic. Watching sea ice flows drift in mostly open water, we could see one reason scientists think the Arctic is warming faster. That's because while sea ice reflects sunlight, the ocean absorbs it. It's a vicious circle. You remove the ice and you expose water. That water is more able to absorb sunlight and heat, and so it causes more warming, which melts more ice and propagates the, the cycle. It's July 14th, and this Coast Guard diver is taking part in the Healy's biggest experiment during this two-week mission a simulated search and rescue in icy Arctic waters. It's a top priority uh, because as the Arctic is uh, opening, there will be uh, additional activity up here and the Coast Guard wants to be prepared to be able to respond if there is a uh, search and rescue needs to occur. The stakes could not be higher. Despite precautions, accidents will happen here. Losing someone overboard is one of the biggest fears, since survival in this frigid environment would be extremely difficult. Time will mean the difference between life and death. Can you walk me through the search and rescue mission? We wanted to look at how to conduct a search and rescue mission up here on the North Slope, where logistics are so tough and assets are so rare and infrastructure is almost non-existent. The scenario, a plane goes down off Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, and this will take the place of the pilot in the water, a 60-pound dummy called Thermal Oscar. It's designed to generate heat like a human body, so infrared cameras can find it. Once this dummy goes into the water, that marks the beginning of the search and rescue drill that the Coast Guard has been planning for months. The location has one thing going for it. Prudhoe Bay and land is about 20 miles away. That means support from assets already in place, something much of the region lacks. A drone called a Scan Eagle, developed for surveillance and military operations like this in Afghanistan, 
is launched from Prudhoe Bay to find the dummy. Once it's in the air, an operator aboard the Healy takes control and begins a search of the simulated crash site. All right, I'm ready for the handoff. All right, Jeff's ready for the handoff. I got it. Got it? I got control of the aircraft. The idea is the drone operator finds the pilot, then provides the location to manned helicopters that fly to the rescue. But while the operation provided valuable information to the Coast Guard, the drone wasn't able to find the dummy. So how'd it go? Uh, the altitude they fly and things like that, you're looking at a field of ice in, in, in a camera's eye. If you can picture looking down at a bowl of water through a straw, that's basically what you've got. The Puma's role was to clean up and guide the ship to Thermal Oscar for pickup when the operation was complete. But Puma operators also struggled to locate Thermal Oscar. Really made me think uh, you don't want to fall off the boat. Why is it especially challenging flying over ice for a Puma pilot? You're looking for that needle in a haystack. In the ice, uh, it became even more of a challenge because what your brain would usually register as land, um, which would be on the ice, is moving too. So we had both the ship drifting and the ice drifting, and they're drifting at different relative speeds. Finding out what works and what doesn't in the Arctic is the point of all these operations. During the search and rescue simulation, the isotope sniffer picked up helicopter exhaust, proof it can detect contamination in the environment. We've had two helicopters fly by the bow of the boat, and we are actually showing in real time that there are two pulses of CO2. And there have been other technological successes. The Puma's automatic capture system worked with a larger net set up on the ship's flight deck. For us, success of a different kind. We made it 74 degrees north. For that, we got special recognition along with Healy crew members who crossed into the Arctic Circle for the first time. All our new polar bears, go ahead and switch your covers. It's July 18th, and we're headed back to Nome. Just as we're heading south, another ship just 20 miles away is passing us, heading north. It's the IVIC, lead ship of the shell fleet that is bringing the Polar Pioneer to the Chukchi Sea. The Coast Guard's research and development team is already preparing for the challenges ahead. Up here, you can't use a boom to collect the oil in the icy environment because it'll rip the boom apart. We've got oleophobic skimmers which collect the oil right up against the ice and clean it. And we're looking at things like ROVs that'll go under the ice to see, hey, is there any oil left under there? And it seems that the you know, predictions have that the Arctic is only going to start to get busier. It's more and more ship traffic. Do you think the Coast Guard's going to be ready? That's why we're here ahead of that, that busyness. We're, we're trying to get as many tools up here to help as possible. At this point, yeah, we're already more ready than we were two years ago. After 13 days at sea, and zero sunsets, for Techno, the mission is over, and I return to the port of Nome and dry land. But for the Healy, the research continues. Healy was designed and put together to support science, science that hopefully will uh, give us reasonable answers uh, for what's going on in the Arctic and also for uh, quite frankly, how we can operate effectively in the Arctic. It's in its very nature. Absolutely. Uh, our motto is uh, from the Arctic knowledge. That's what we're here so that we can learn about literally the last frontier. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.